It must have been scary living before the time of vaccines and antibiotics. A small minority of those who ruled were well protected in their impressive castles where they enjoyed decent food and basic sanitation. But the vast majority of people were living in their modest, basic, unsanitary homes, often together with their animals. There, they were dying mainly from infectious diseases. Every time they had a cut in their skin, or touched their sick animals, or drank something that wasn't boiled, or ate something poisoned, or developed a cough or a fever, it could have been the beginning of their end. To make things worse, epidemics that were collectively called the plague were occasionally ripping through entire villages, simultaneously taking away the lives of the many. A really sad aspect of this harsh life was that people didn't even understand why was it all happening to them. One of the first people who hypothesized that their diseases may be caused by an invisible army of tiny living beings that coexisted with us on the same planet, the microorganisms, was an Italian scholar named Girolamo Fracastoro. In his 16th century work, he proposed that minuscule life forms responsible for infectious diseases can reproduce, multiply, and that they are poisonous. He even noticed that fire can destroy them and that sanitary living conditions are very important. But very few took him seriously, because how could anything possibly be invisible, they thought. At the time, most people took for granted that we can see everything there is to see. It took another century before a Dutchman, Antony van Leeuwenhoek, developed a microscope and confirmed the existence of microscopic worlds that we could not see with our naked eye. To everyone's surprise, in those new worlds, there were many incredibly small creatures and they were moving, reproducing and multiplying at a very fast rate. But as the knowledge of microorganisms evolved, the most prominent scholars realized that there was a strange twist in this story. It turned out that once we are born, we need microorganisms more than anything. Our immune system is silenced during the first months to allow colonization of our gut and our skin with trillions of tiny microorganisms. We desperately need them to protect us from various skin infections and to digest everything that we eat, and they collectively form our own personal microbiome. As a result, we probably carry more bacterial cells in our body than our own cells, so we seem to need those invisible friends more than they need us. It turns out that our bodies are merely mixed bags of many trillions of our own cells and just as many microbial cells. They are held together by our immune system, which needs to correctly recognize most of those microbes as friends and allow them into our system while keeping out a tiny minority of potential enemies. Interactions between our own personal microbes and our own cells are so numerous and complex that an increasing number of scientists believe that we cannot properly understand our health or diseases without taking into account the role of our microbiome. This is becoming an exciting new area of study. But with so many invisible friends in our body, why are some of their relatives causing us so much concern? Well, microbes themselves keep reproducing, mutating and diversifying to increase their own chances of survival, just like all other species do. In this process, some forms are randomly created that just happen to cause harm to our own systems. This causes symptoms specific for each invader, turning them into our visible enemies. Causing harm to a hosting organism is rude and unintelligent. It's like destroying and endangering a desirable habitat. Typically, our enemies come in three groups. Parasites are often multicellular and can be quite sophisticated. Bacteria are built of a single cell and exhibit huge diversity. Viruses don't even have a cell of their own, but only encapsulated genetic material. Let's describe a very notable example of each group, malaria, tuberculosis, and AIDS. 
In medieval Italian, malaria means bad air, as people correctly recognized that this disease had something to do with air. It is caused by a tiny parasite called plasmodium, which lives in the gut and salivary glands of a female mosquito in one part of its life cycle. The other part of life cycle occurs in human body after mosquitoes bite us. The parasite will firstly settle in our liver, but then it will invade our red blood cells. When they are invaded and destroyed, we experience terrible chills, fever, sweating, headache and vomiting. But plasmodium has to find its way back from the liver into our blood, so that a mosquito could pick it up again. For understanding this peculiar life cycle, British doctor Ronald Ross received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1902. A French army doctor, Charles Laveran, who was the first one to observe the parasites inside the red blood cells in Algeria and suspected them to be the cause of disease, received his Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1907. Malaria used to affect people all over the world, but today it is limited to mosquito habitats in warm regions of Africa, Asia and Latin America. More than 200 million people still get infected each year, and nearly half a million die from severe forms, which involve anemia, respiratory distress, seizures, and coma. Most deaths are recorded among children and young people in Africa. Historically, people treated malaria with kinin, an extract from the tree that grows mainly on the slopes of the Andes in South America, which Jesuits brought to Europe in the 17th century. In the 20th century, kinin was replaced by chloroquine, but the parasite developed resistance to both treatments. Thankfully, a researcher of traditional Chinese herbal medicine, Tu Yu Yu, introduced artemisinins and they are the most effective treatment today. For her discovery, she was awarded a Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2015. Massive efforts are being invested to develop an effective vaccine to protect against malaria and eradicate it, but this has been a very difficult goal. Meanwhile, many lives were saved through distribution of hundreds of millions of insecticide-treated bed nets to protect young children in Africa from mosquito bites. Tuberculosis is a bacterial disease. It is caused by a peculiar bacillus called Mycobacterium, which was first identified by a German physician, Robert Koch, leading to his Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1905. This microbe infected one-third of the entire human population by being coughed up by those with active disease. Once the microbe is inhaled, immune cells encapsulate it somewhere in the lungs, so it usually doesn't cause any further harm. Still, each year, in about 9 million of infected individuals, many of those who are poor, weak, undernourished, living in crowded and unsanitary conditions, it will escape its immune control and cause a chronic cough with blood containing sputum, fever, night sweats and persistent weight loss, and this will eventually kill between 1 and 2 million people each year. If that sounds like a lot, we should remember that two centuries ago tuberculosis was causing one in four of all deaths in European adults, and it remained the leading cause of death even at the beginning of the 20th century. Death rates started falling after French doctors Calmet and Girin managed to develop a vaccine in 1906 using attenuated bovine strain of the microbe. This vaccine is still in use, and it covers nearly all of the world's children today. Further decline in death rates came as a result of improvements in sanitation, nutrition and life conditions and a discovery of several antibiotics, such as streptomycin, that could eventually cure tuberculosis, especially when combined with others. In 1952, an American microbiologist, Selman Waxman, received a Nobel Prize for Medicine for discovering streptomycin. 
but our hopes of completely eradicating tuberculosis were dented since 1980s with the emergence of drug-resistant strains and the unexpected increase in the number of cases. This increase turned out to be a side effect of an entirely new and unexpected threat, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, also known as AIDS. AIDS is a disease caused by a virus known as HIV or human immunodeficiency virus. This retrovirus originated in Africa, but around 1970 it spread to Haiti and then to the United States. Its most common forms of transmission are sexual contact, blood transfusions, shared needles among drug users, and from mothers to children. It efficiently spread across the world in the 1970s because it doesn't cause any symptoms for several years after the initial infection. So, when an alarm was finally raised in the USA in early 1980s, millions of people have already been infected without knowing. French virologists Luc Montagnier and François Barré-Sinoussi described the new retrovirus as a potential cause in 1983 for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2008. After an initial infection and its long silent phase, HIV begins to interfere with the immune system, specifically with T cells, which are very important in protection from infections and cancers. This increases the risk of a whole range of very unusual infections and uncommon tumors, such as Kaposi sarcoma, which is not normally seen in healthy people. Weight loss and generalized enlargement of lymph nodes are common in this final stage, which is referred to as AIDS. By the year 2015, 40 million people have died and more than 35 million were still living with HIV, with about 1 million continuing to die each year, mainly in Africa. There is no cure or vaccine yet, but antiretroviral drugs slow the course of the disease and lead to a near-normal life expectancy. But without treatment, the average survival after contracting HIV virus is 11 years, and after the onset of AIDS, it's only about 1 to 2 years. Today, Two-thirds of new cases occur in Sub-Saharan Africa, where life expectancy dropped below 40 years in some countries, leaving more than 12 million African children without their parents. In the 21st century, the world began an organized fight against these three diseases. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria was established in 2002 in Geneva, Switzerland, as a public-private partnership between governments of wealthy countries and philanthropic foundations. Between 2002 and 2016, the Global Fund raised $30 billion. It distributed more than 600 million insecticide-treated bed nets to combat malaria, provided anti-tuberculosis treatment for 15 million people and antiretroviral therapy for AIDS for 9 million people. In addition to this massive effort, US government launched a special additional program to combat HIV AIDS in Africa under the President George W. Bush called PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. This multi-billion initiative provided antiretroviral treatment to 8 million HIV-infected people in poor African settings and supported HIV testing and counseling for more than 60 million people. Our three visible enemies, malaria, tuberculosis and AIDS, have caused hundreds of millions of human deaths. But we are beginning to understand them better, and our efforts to defend and protect ourselves have led to positive results. But what if a similar, but entirely new and unknown enemy strikes us without any warning? Thanks to the advancement of science in this century, we are beginning to understand where these new threats may come from. Few things on this planet could cause the entire humanity more harm, so keeping a very close eye on them seems like a very good idea.